Yeah. yeah, now LA, uh, people know uh, from videos of you throughout the years, you like to have fun and you're a baseball player and you get it. Um, now, you said you weren't liked in Seattle maybe by the organization as much. I just read today about this Jello prank, <laughs> uh, which I did not know about. So for those out there that might not be familiar with you, you're one of the great pranksters and you, you really enjoyed your time in baseball. Um, what were you thinking uh, pulling the bed out of the room of your manager? Uh, can you please explain the Jello prank to those that might not be familiar with it? But this might take a couple months. Um, the Jello prank went on for about Hi. six months. <laughs> um, but it started with uh, Joe Simpson, who's currently a broadcaster with uh, the Braves. Um, he was our center fielder. Uh, Richie Zisk, who was our DH in Seattle. Um, the three of us got together, and, and Renee Latchin was our manager, who I, one of my favorite managers of all time, um, because he was honest. Just, I mean, dead honest. And he would tell you in your face, you're not good enough. And he basically told me I wasn't good enough to come back to the Phillies, I mean, to the uh, Mariners in 83. Um, but uh, he actually told me in, in spring training, he said, you know, you're going to have to earn the winter before spring training in 83. He said, you know, you're going to have to have a good spring to make this club. And I said, Latch, why are you lying to me? And he goes, I'm not lying. I never lie to you. I'm going to lie to you. I'm not lying to anybody. I was like, well, you just did. And he goes, how? And I said, you said I was going to have to have a good spring to make this club. And he goes, exactly. I said, no, that's, that's a lie. He goes, how? I said, I'm going to have to have an outstanding spring to make this club, and you know it. And he kind of laughed, and he said, well, maybe. And, <laughs> but anyway, uh, he was just a great guy. But he would he liked to have his social sparklers now and then. And we were in Chicago, and he went out to Rush Street and kind of got in a little late. Well, in the hotel lobby bar, there was uh, Lee Pelicudis was our traveling secretary, who later became their general manager. But he was our traveling secretary. He got a key for us to latch his suite. So Richie Zisk, Simpson, and myself, we went and bought 18 or 16 boxes of cherry jello. He had two toilets in his suite. We got the key from Lee. We get in suite, put eight boxes of jello in each toilet, got buckets of ice, put it in the toilet, start stirring it, <laughs> trying to get it to gel. We took his bed, put it in the shower, um, his mattress, I should say. Uh, we toilet papered his room. We took all the light pieces out, all the light fixtures out, the light bulb. <laughs> Um, and we took the mouthpiece out of his phone. Oh, wow. Uh, and we un unplugged every, anything that was plugged in, we unplugged. So his alarm had like 1101. Uh, so that's when he knew who's, this is when it happened uh, at night. Uh, he came home from, from Rush Street and just wanted to plop on his bed. Well, all there was was a box spring. <laughs> uh, and then we had wrote, written some things in French on his mirror and with soap. Um, and so it basically became the great Jello caper. Um, and it went on. We actually, for every road trip we had after that, he would have a bowl of Jello in his suite. The big boy Lee would, would set it up ahead of time. And so he just got going. And so we were in Baltimore one time, you know, later in the season. And uh, and Dave Niehaus said, Latch, I, I think I, when we had Dave Niehaus as our broadcaster, Hall of Fame broadcaster, he was in on it. And he goes, Latch, I think I, I think I know what's going on with the Jello stuff. And he goes, I got it on my recorder. And Latch says, well, give it to me. He says, no, I can't. I got to do the pregame show and the postgame. So after that, I'll bring it in to you. So it just so happened um, after the game. Richie's, we won the game. Richie just got a big game, so he was the star of the game. So we said to Richie, he said, before you do the, the, the radio show at postgame, he said, make sure you tell Dave to, you know, come in the clubhouse and tell Latch that he lost the you record it over it or whatever. So after the game, Latch walks into the clubhouse and he goes, Dave, Niehaus, come here. And Dave started to say something and 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 just kind of shook his head like, no, Latch, I can't. And Latch blurted out, those blankety blanks got to you, didn't they? <laughs> so he, he knew something was going on. So then we went to New York after that. We got where you know where you could used to be able to make up newspaper headlines. Yeah. But we, I had uh, probably about ten or fifteen newspaper headlines made up. It said uh, Jello Gate tapes lost. Last <laughs> apple. And it just and it kind of just went on. And then at the end of the season, um, we made uh, three of the big uh, brown paper grocery sacks or bags, and wrote and made a uh, Joe Simpson kind of colored them in like they were Jello. Uh, boxes and the three of us put them on our head and latched did kind of a what's my line thing or who you know 
asking questions, trying to figure out who it was. He still didn't know who the three guys were specifically until after this team party at the end of the season. And that's right. basically how it unfolded. Oh, that, is that. A, that is a tight-knit that. locker room. Yeah. Yeah, see, I, secrets were safe in there, I guess, LA, huh? <laughs> yeah. I love that you uh, tell that story with a straight face. And honestly, I feel <laughs> it makes me wonder what else happened because I was I was reading and watching some past interviews and different things. And I know you you mentioned you didn't actually I didn't know about the Jello story itself, but different things about, you know, the the celebrations, the dance parties, jamming out to, you know, high hopes, Mitch Williams, aka Mitchie Poo, uh, Sunflower Seeds, all everything, the spin doctors, you know, a lot of very memorable moments. And I'm sure, and I wish we had time to talk about them all day. But I'm curious to know, outside of the Jello story, <laughs> what is something that stands out as one of the most memorable, it could be wild, funny, whatever um, you know, direction it goes story from your experiences with these guys uh, during your time in Philly? Um, 1993, our number one draft pick was Wayne Gomes. He came out of uh, Old Dominion. Um, I was coaching in triple. No, it was actually, it was 90. He was our number one pick in 93, but I coached him in 95 when I was a player coach in double A. And uh, he kept messing with me. We had the pitchers chart the games and he kept breaking the pencils to, to go with the chart to chart the games. So I said, I called him Grimace. I had nicknames for all of them. I called him Grimace from the McDonald's the <laughs> purple thing. Um, so I said, Grimace, you keep doing it. You keep messing with me. I'm going to get you. Well, he kept the next day. Sure enough, he breaks the pencil. I'm like, all right, that's it. Well, I got in touch with the Phillies organization, talked with Lee Thomas, our general manager, had him in on it, Gomes's agent, had everybody in on this thing. And uh, Bill Dancy was our manager in Reading, and we had a meeting after a game. And he said, uh, I just want you guys to know that uh, Wayne Gomes has just been traded to Japan. And they had a crew come in uh, uh, from ESPN, the magazine. And that's they asked me to set this up. And they said, do you have a prank? Can you pull a prank, you know, for the program? And I said, I'll figure something out. So this is what it was. He he got on the phone with, and they, they had a guy named James Chang, who was actually Korean, but um, and he had a microphone, had his the, the mic that you plug in, he had it in his coat pocket, in his sports coat. So nothing was going, nothing was really happening, but they followed him around and they said, well, they're doing a, a special documentary for minor league baseball for a Japanese company. And so they had, they said they have permission to go anywhere they want. So he followed Gomzi around all the time. And then when he found out he was traded, he gets on the phone, he goes in Bill Dancy's office, the manager's office, he's calling his mom, he's calling his girlfriend or fiance at the time. And he's like, I just got traded to Japan. I'm going to, I think I'm going to Nomo's old team, the Yasuchuchi, Massachusetts or something. And he couldn't even say what it was, but he was, he was dumbfounded. And it's, it went on um, that day throughout uh, the, the, wor the workout and spring training. He's packing his bags. He's throwing his shoes to Larry Mitchell, who was his best friend on the team. Mitch is like oh, crying. He goes, I don't want your shoes. I don't want them. It just, it, it got going. So I almost got to the point where I felt bad, just a little bit, but not a lot. Just a little. And almost. So after all this happened, after batting, this was actually, pre, I'm sorry, pregame all this happened. And then after the game, um, Dance came in and said, well, um, you, you know, you said, do you want to say something, L.A., and, and talk, you know, just about what's going on? And I said, well, I, you know, I appreciate what you've done for us this year, Gomzi, and I'm, I'm sorry you're not going to be here for the playoffs. It's just sad. Um, but... Um, you know, I, I'm not going to miss the fact that you kept messing with me, kept breaking the pencils. And I said, I told you I would get you. And I just got 